Okay, the one more point that I wanted to talk about is uh, cross-validation. So now uh, this goes back to the problem of uh, how to choose a good lambda, right? So now you have decided you want to do a regularization, let's say L2 regularization, uh, and then you have put this lambda in the objective value, but how do you choose a good lambda for your problem? So of course if, you, if somebody tells you this is the test set on which you want to test, you can actually train for different lambdas and test it on the test set and see what is the error. But nobody is going to give you the test set, right? So if you had the test set, you might as well optimize in the test set. Why, why use the training set at, at all in the first place? So nobody gives you the test set. So you only have the train set. So we somehow want to mimic the performance on the test set using the train set, right? So and the, what is an intuitive way to do that, right? So this is our training set, let's say. The typical way one, one might want to do is, so you cut off 30% of it and call this a validation set, right? So this will be our train. Now you train your model on this. You don't show the validation set to the model. Train it on this and then test it on your validation set and get a prediction accuracy. It might so happen that the validation set that you have by random chance happen to be bad f with respect to the training that you start that that you had basically the split that you did you might have just gotten unlucky right so the split was bad which means the validation set was not as representative as your training set and you don't want that to happen so the way to do that is uh, you create multiple train test validation sets you take different random splits of 70 30% let's say of train and validation sets and then you train on the train set test it on the validation set, mar note the accuracy, again do that for every split, and then average it over all the splits. This is for a particular choice of lambda. Right? Now you change the lambda, use the same splits, and train it for that particular lambda, and see what, how does the accuracy behave. And you, as you change lambdas, you will get different accuracies, and then pick the lambda that works well for your case. Right? So what, what people typically do is uh, when you don't have too much training data, which is rarely a problem these days. You, these days you have too much training data, that's the problem. But in the cases where you don't have too much training data, one way to do it is called as uh, uh, leave one out uh, cross-validation. It's just uh, leaving just one point out for the validation test. Right, so and then you use n minus m minus one points for your training, and then just use test it on the last point, and then you create m such training sets, and then uh, average it and see what your accuracy is. So that is how uh, you pick the regularization parameter lambda. Right. Uh, so uh, any questions till now? Because in the next maybe 15 minutes, I'll quickly cover generative versus discriminative paradigms. So is this clear? And why we do regularization and how it helps the bias variance trade off and so on. Yeah. Okay, so let's quickly move on to part two, uh, which I'll try to cover in a faster fashion. I think a lot of these things will also be covered in detail in the next couple of days, starting from this afternoon. I just wanted to give a flavor for what these things are. Um, of course, we'll, to refresh, we had the supervised learning different types binary, multi class, regression, and so on. Um, this is multi-class, this is regression, and in, in, the, in the, let's go back to the classification, the standard binary classification setting, where you had these features, and then you have training sets, output labels, um, and the way to relate training and tests, as I said, is uh, there is a probability distribution, joint distribution over X and Y, which not only generates the training set, but also the test set, right? So now, we want to somehow capture this joint distribution using the training data, right? And the way you actually model this giant distribution, what you choose to model in this giant distribution determines how our model will be, right? So, so let's, let's for a moment think, what if somebody gives you this P of X comma Y? Somebody actually tells you what is the probability of every feature comma label, right? So this is given to you as information. So now what would be your answer? I mean, what would be your algorithm? to predict for a new new data point. If you had information about p, p of x comma y. So, so if you had p of x comma y, the right thing to do is to predict, is to compute the probability of a label given the feature, right? 
So how do you do that? Which means you want to compute p of y given x. You know the joint distribution. It's easy to compute the conditional distribution because p of y given x is p of x given y by p of x, right? So how do you get p of x? You just marginalize it over uh, p of x comma y, which is p of x comma 0 plus p of x comma 1. So let's say you have now p of y given x. Now what would be your answer? So give, I give you a new x. You have computed p of y given x. How will you predict y? In, this, in the case of binary classification, what would be your answer? The label for which the probability is higher. P of y given x is a, is a probability distribution, right? In the binary classification, it's just two numbers, y equal to 1, y equal to 0. So the way you do that is if probability of label is 1, given the feature is greater than probability of label equal to 0, given the feature, then predict 1, else 0. This is the best that you can do. But what is the problem? Well, this, you cannot beat this classifier. Nothing, no matter how you try, you cannot beat a classifier that predicts better than this. Right? So, but what is the inherent problem with this pr classifier? What, what assumptions did we make which, is not, which does not hold in practice? Nobody is going to give us. I mean, if, if you, but life is hard. So nobody gives us uh, p of x given y, right? So all we know about p of x given y is only through the training data, right? So now you have to somehow model p of x given y. And the way you choose to model uh, differentiates between two different paradigms of uh, supervised learning, right? So the two different models uh, at a high level in supervised learning are those uh, called as discriminative models versus those which are called as generative models. The discriminative models are try, try to model p of label given feature, that is p of y given x directly, right? So you want to assume certain model for p of y given x and try to find the best model that fits the data. The generative model, you model the joint distribution, not just the conditional, but the joint distribution itself. That is, uh, you might model p of feature given labels, the class conditional probabilities, basically given that it is class 0, what is the chance that I will see this feature? You can model that. And also you can model what is the probability of finding a label. If you have modeled p of x given y and p of y, it is equivalently modeling p of x comma y, right? So because it's just a product of uh, these two. So, these, th so we'll see examples of uh, discriminative model versus generative model uh, and uh, see why, how they, when to use what. So, uh, so there's something called as logistic regression, which will be covered much more detail in the afternoon session. Probably some of you already know this. So, so the logistic function is just a kind of a squashing function, right? So it, you give any number between minus infinity and infinity, it's going to give you a number between 0 and 1, right? So it's, it's, it's called, uh, it converts any real number into something between 0 and 1. So this is just to keep in mind. So what is the logistic regression problem? So it's called a regression thing. It's actually a classification problem. So you are given x. Right? So, and then you develop some model and you want to predict. So what does the model do? It computes W transpose X for a certain W that it has learned. And it applies the logistic function over this learned W transpose X. W transpose X is just W1 X1 plus W D X D. It's just a number. It's just weighting your features using certain weights given by W. And then you apply a logistic function to it. So which means it converts that number to a number between 0 and 1. And now that is your probability of class 1, right? So your, your prediction will be 1 if that number is greater than 0.5. If your prediction will be 0 if that number is less than 0.5, right? So, so, that, so that is your logistic regression problem. So now, is this a discriminative model or a generative model in the sense that we described earlier? Some say generative, some say discriminative. So let's say those who say discriminative, why is it a discriminative model? So what are we modeling here? So, so, so we are saying that logistic of W transpose X gives the probability that Y equals 1 for a given X. But then we have not really said what is the probability of seeing this X. We are not really modeling the x at all, right? So we are only modeling the probability of y equals 1 given x as a logistic function of w transpose x, right? So in that sense, so this is a discriminative model because you are modeling the conditionals. You are modeling the probability that y equals 1 given x as a logistic of w transpose x, right? Uh, 
So now how do you find the weights, right? So given that you have fixed this model, so this is the model with which I'm going to work with. So now, of course, if you know W, you can do the prediction and so on, but how do you get the Ws, right? So that is given, I mean, you using the standard method. So how do you find the W? You find the W that best fits the data. Because you have a probabilistic model now, right, for the for assumed for, the, for the, in the way the data is generated, now you can maximize the probability of finding the W that fits the data the, the best. Right, so you'll so the exact way in which it is done probably will be spoken about in the upcoming session. But I just wanted to give you a heads up as to what you are trying to model here. Right, so here is another thing. So this is what is called a support vector machines. Again, this will be discussed in details uh, in the coming classes. So what it does is you are given these points, and some are blue, which are plus ones, and some are reds, which are minus ones, and you are trying to learn a classifier, which kind of separates the blues from the reds. Right, so now. Um, what are we modeling here? So is this a discriminative model or a generative model? So why is this a generative model? So what, so what are we trying to find? So we are just trying to find a line which separates the red from the blue. So in other words, so given a new point, given a x, you don't care how this x is generated, given a new x, you will now say whether this x belongs to the right side of the line or the left side of the line. And based on that, you make your prediction, right? So you're not even modeling the probabilities here. So these are also discriminative models where you model directly the mapping from input features to the labels, not even in a probabilistic fashion. So you're just modeling for a given x, what is the y, right? So the model here is the y is given by this line, which side of the line the x falls on, right? And that's why this is also called as a discriminative model. Yeah. Uh, I'll come back to a generative model example. So all I'm saying is right now we are trying to model, we are not saying how the x itself is generated. We don't care. In our data set, we are given x comma y pairs. We don't care how, we are, we are not trying to model how the x is generated or we are trying to, the assumption that we are making is on how the y is generated given the x. In the logistic regression case, we are saying, given, if somebody gives me an x, I will say the probability of y equals 1 given this x is logistic of w transpose x. I don't really care how the x is generated. Similarly, in support vector machines, this is also discriminative. I don't care how somebody gives me an x. I will say the y is 1 if the x falls on right side of the line, otherwise it's left side. So the model is only trying to capture y given x, but not really capturing how the x is generated. But I'll give an example of a model, which is specifically what is called as a Gaussian discriminant analysis, which tries to model both, right? So what it does is it makes the following assumption as to how the data is generated. Here you, you flip the way in which the data generative model happens. You first generate a label. Right? So you toss a coin with probability phi or phi, right? so, and if it falls heads, then you call it uh, label 0, or let's say label 1, and if it falls tails, then you call it label 0. So once that coin is tossed, let's say it fell head, which means the label is 1. Now given that the coin has fallen as heads, now you have a distribution over your x. Right? So, so now your distribution is some normal distribution centered at around mean. So let's say that is... Uh, let us, so this would be for your uh, y equals 1 case, and this is for your y equals 0 case. If y is 1, then I will generate an x which is centered at this point with certain variance. Right? So that is how my first point in my data set is generated. Now to generate a second point in my data set, again I will toss a coin with some probability phi. If it falls tails in this case, now I will go to this uh, mean and variance, and I'll generate a data point. Let's say that's how this data point gets generated. Now I repeat this, and I keep repeating this, right? So now I get 100 different points. This is an assumption as to how the data itself is generated. I'm not saying this is how the data would have been generated. Somebody gives you a data set, but then you are making a modeling assumption that the data set has been generated in this particular fashion, where the y was first decided, and then the x given y's distribution decides which x you got, and then somebody gave you an x comma y, and then they gave you 100 different points. Now, if this was the assumption in which the data was generated, then what are the parameters that best fits this model? That is what you are, you'll ask. So you'll ask the reverse question. Now I am given the data set. What are the parameters which will best explain the data that I have seen if the data had been generated in this particular fashion? 
right so so now note that you are not just making a assumption modeling assumption on y given x you are also making an assumption on how x is also generated so that is that is where the difference comes yeah so i'll i'll come to that so that is my last slide so we'll come to that so uh, so so right now note that this specifies both right it specifies both probability of y and probability of x given y which means you are basically modeling the joint distribution in this case right uh, it is a generative model so again the problem is to learn the parameters of this model which will most likely explain the training data uh, on the other hand your logistic regression just to make the difference is uh, probability of y given x is what you are modeling which is not a generative model which is a discriminative model now for the million dollar question so generate or discriminate so that is the question uh, the answer is it depends so there is no single answer to this question so the easier way to model would be to just model y given x because that's all you care about right all you care about is whether you are getting the answer classification answer right or wrong right so you don't care how the x typically you don't really have to care how the x is generated on the other hand if you have some reason to believe that the x is x itself is generated in a particular fashion right so if you have some domain knowledge that your data is generated in a particular fashion then it makes sense to go for a generative model right so typically if your generative model that you assume if it reflects the truth then you will get good parameter fits with much lesser samples right so you only need a fewer samples to get a good fit however uh, if the generative model is not aligned with the truth then it becomes an issue so if you have no information about the way data is generated the standard way i mean the usual way is to go for a discriminative model but then if you know how the data is generated then typically people go for a uh, generative model so for example the, i mean the the people who make the case for discriminative models say the following so let's say you're trying to learn um uh, you are trying to distinguish between two different languages right so let's say hindi and english you don't really have to understand how how hindi words are generated and how english words are generated to just distinguish between whether a sentence is in hindi or english the discriminative capacity does not require understanding of how the language itself is generated right so if that is the case you only can use a discriminative model to find out whether a word is in hindi or english but but then there are cases where you may have much more detail about how the lang uh, i mean how the problems data itself comes about right so in those cases it makes much more sense to use a generative model so uh, as you go along in this course in the next few lectures and so on uh, ask the question whether the models that you are trying to learn are generative or discriminative and see where what makes sense and uh, um i think you'll learn a host of methods starting from i don't know if gda will be covered but logistic regressions spms and other generative models as well later in the course in the probabilistic graphical models cases uh try to figure out what you're learning is a generative model or a discriminative model um and these are some things to keep in mind so i will stop here um uh, and this will be my last lecture so if you have any other any questions you can ask me now or uh, you can you can write to me at this id so yeah so i also want to do a slight small bit of advertisement so there are if people are interested in internships at conduent you can write to me and we'll see if we can do a fit so typically third years fourth years people uh, who are interested in machine learning uh you can feel free to write to me uh, any questions at this point before i stop okay yeah so you can do a lot of things in multi class so multi class let's say you have 10 different classes in the handwriting recognition case right 0 to 9 right so so people have studied various hosts of methods where you can directly try to model the p of y given x where you try to get a probability distribution over all classes all your deep learning algorithms and those kind of things do that or you can use your 
binary classification as a black box and then try to do, you can try to differentiate between pairs of classes, right? So you take your data set, only take the data sets corresponding to digit one and digit two, and then try to learn a classifier. Then digit three and digit four and so on. And then given a new digit, you send it through all these classifiers and then use a com combination function to come up with an answer. So this is called as a uh, one versus one. So there is a one versus rest way to do that in the sense that you take all your data points, make your class, the data points corresponding to digit one as class one and every other data point as class zero. Now it's one versus rest, right? So now you have lesser number of classifiers to learn uh, and some cases this also works. So, and there are multiple other ways to do multi, multi classes. So that's a separate uh, topic in itself, yeah. Okay, thank you very much.